Hi, and welcome to the Foundations course lesson 4 on hypothesis testing and the p-value. This is what we're going to talk about today, and we're going to start with a correct definition and application of hypothesis testing and the p-value. To do this, we're going to break up all the studies that are used in clinical research, and the first step is the study design phase, in which a researcher poses a relevant question and uh, starts to design a study. And in that study design, a sample size estimation should be made. And two important uh, factors that are used in this sample size estimation are type 1 error rate, or the alpha level, and power. And then we're going to start our study, and we're going to collect data. And those data originate from a sample, and that sample should be a random sample from the population. And we're going to start to look at the statistical summary of the sample data. And what we're actually interested in is usually a difference or an effect or an association. And what we want to know is how we can estimate those parameters of interest. And for this, we usually use a central tendency measure and a measure of spread. And then uh, after we've estimated those parameters, we want to know whether we can explain these data summaries as potential chance variability or whether we should say that, for example, a difference that we have found in our study uh, is actually true. So if we would rephrase that, we can also ask whether the sample derives its properties from the population or not. And in order to do that, we're going to use hypothesis testing to evaluate the compatibility of the observed data with the specified statistical model. And in this model, the null hypothesis is usually defined as there is no difference or an effect. And the alternative hypothesis is defined as there is a difference or effect. And that specified statistical model actually assumes that the null hypothesis is true. So uh, we are going to assume that all differences found are due to chance variability. But we also assume certain other things that are less oftenly specified, like how the data were collected, analyzed, and selected for presentation. And using this information, we calculate a p-value. And that p-value is defined as the probability under our specified statistical model that a statistical summary of the data would be equal to or more extreme than its observed value in the study. And we can also do this to estimate between group differences. And um, here we want to know whether we can explain this difference between the groups as potential chance variability. And the p-value is defined as the probability under our specified statistical model that the between group difference would be equal to or more extreme than its observed value. Let's look at some of these things in more detail. I already referred to type 1 error and power, uh, but this is what it means. So here on the left side, uh, we see our decision in our study. Uh, on the top, we don't reject the null hypothesis. So we say that there is no evidence of a effect. And in the uh, lower row, we do reject it. So we say there is evidence of an effect. And then here, I have denoted the reality. So these two columns here are the least interesting because we make a correct decision. But what if we do reject the null hypothesis? So we say there is evidence of a difference, whereas in reality, no such uh, effect or difference exists. That is what we call a type, type 1 error and it's denoted by the Greek letter alpha. On the other hand, we can also falsely not reject the null hypothesis. So we say there is no evidence of a difference or effect, whereas in reality there is such a difference or effect. And that's what we call the type 2 error. And this means that we fail to detect a realistic difference or effect. And the power is 1 minus that beta, because it's the probability of detecting a true difference or effect. 
in theory, you could choose whatever value you like in your sample size estimation for alpha and power, but there are typical choices in medical research. For alpha, usually 0.05 is used, very seldomly 0.01. And for power, usually people choose 0.80 or 0.90, in which 0.90 is the more strict one and usually results in a larger required sample size. All right, so here's an example. Let's say uh, we want to know whether oral propanolol effectively lowers blood pressure in patients with hypertension. We're going to random, uh, randomize these patients, so we're going to perform an RCT, and uh, we're going to measure the drop in systolic blood pressure with regard to baseline, and we're going to compare the placebo with the propanolol group. And in the analysis, uh, we are going to use an independent student's t-test, and uh, we're going to use a two-tailed test with alpha levels of 0.05 and a power of 0.80. And then we're going to uh, calculate the required sample size. Let's talk a little bit about tills. Well, I don't mean these kind of tills, but I mean statistical tills. If you use a two-tailed test, that means that you're interested in a difference or effect between groups and you do not uh, specify in which direction. So um, if we look at uh, the distribution of uh, the parameters here in group 1 and group 2, you can see that uh, the value of group 1 is lower than that of group 2 and here the vice versa. And if we uh, perform our analysis with a two-tailed test, we're going to spend our alpha on both sides of the curve. So you keep 0.025 uh, on the left side and the right side, um, uh, depending on uh, which group uh, has the higher value. And this is the default. So if you do not specify uh, whether you have used a two-tailed or one-tailed test, um, everyone's going to assume that you're using a two-tailed test. But you can use a one-tailed uh, test, and then you have to specify which direction you are interested in. So for example, uh, your alternative hypothesis here would be that group two mean is larger than group one mean. And we only spend our alpha on the right side of the curve. And the alternative scenario would be that group 2 mean is lower than group 1 mean, and we spend our alpha on the left side of the curve. OK, so we've taken a random sample, um, and we compared it to the population. And we've already said that most of the time we are going to compare two groups in that uh, sample and we want to know whether they derive from the same population. And we're going to estimate the difference, a parameter between those two groups. And the upper row in the former image would be uh, where we compare the mean uh, plus minus standard deviation or a median from a group uh, of patients that we have followed and included in our analysis and we're going to compare it with the population. And we can do the same for a percentage. And the uh, lower row of the former image is the scenario where we compare both groups in terms of means uh, and standard deviation or a median and range or percentage. And in this scenario, we want to know whether the between group variation or difference is larger than the within group variation or difference. And what we're going to estimate is the mean between group difference and its 95% confidence interval. The next step is that we want to know whether we can explain the data summary as potential chance variability, but we're actually going to assume that all differences found in our study are chance variability, because we assume that the null hypothesis is true in the statistical model. And as I've already alluded to, we're going to assume other things as well. For example, in the data collection, that there is no selection bias and that there is a strict adherence to the study protocol. 
and in the data analysis um, that uh, a pre-planned analysis is followed with specific sample size estimation and no additional uh, analysis uh, are performed that are not pre-planned. In terms of selecting results for presentations, we're going to assume that all results uh, are presented, uh, none are withheld, and uh, no selection is made on the basis of the p-value magnitude. As we've stated, we're going to use hypothesis testing to evaluate the compatibility of the observed data with the specified statistical model by comparing groups. And then we are going to look at the between group difference and the associated standard error. And we're going to look up that standard error in the standard normal distribution table. And we're going to calculate a p-value with the definition the probability under a specified statistical model that the between di group difference would be equal to or more extreme than its observed value. Now, let's say we find a very low p-value. What, what does that actually mean? It simply means that the observed data are incompatible with the statistical model. And from that, you can either conclude that the null hypothesis is not true or the assumptions on how the study was performed are false. And if we find a high p-value, it simply means that the observed data are not unusual under the statistical model. So the null hypothesis and many other hypotheses could explain the data. And note that only if the p is 1.00, which you uh, hardly ever find, is the best explanation for the data. So it's not possible to confirm the null hypothesis. This is a very important point because absence of evidence does not signify evidence of no effect. And this is something that a lot of researchers misapply um, and they state that no difference was found because um, there was no statistical significance or in other words, p-value exceeded the boundary of 0.05. Is a short intermezzo on the historical aspects of hypothesis testing and the p-value. These are the three founding fathers of statistics, in my opinion, Thomas Bayes, Carl Friedrich Gauss, and Pierre Simon Laplace. And they have worked on many things, but um, basically established the mathematical foundations for um, many of the things that we nowadays use in medical research. Yet it is these six men that have elaborated on that work and um, really laid down the foundations for the practical work in medical research as nowadays is applied. Carl Pearson and Sir Ronald Elma Fisher um, were the first pioneers. They more or less worked in the same period and then came the student um, and in just a second, I will reveal the name of this mysterious man. And Jersey Neyman and Egan Sharp Pearson, they work together a lot. And uh, Egan Sharp Pearson is actually the son of Carl Pearson and Sir Austin Bradford Hill. Well, who's this guy with the Guinness logo? It's William Seeley Gossett. He worked with, for the brewing company and wanted to use biostatistics to improve the brewing process. He actually came to discover a scientific uh, method nowadays called the student's t-test, um, among other things. And he wanted to publish this work in the literature, but Guinness didn't let him use his own name. So he used the alias student. And that's why we nowadays uh, call the t-test, for example, the student's t-test. These men um, developed most of the fundamentals uh, of medical uh, statistics, as you can see here, and it's just too much to sum up. But uh, as you can see, there are many things that we recognize. What's interesting to note is that uh, both Sir Ronald Elmer Fisher and the duo of Jersey Neyman and Egan Pearson worked on hypothesis testing and the p-value, but um, their work was 
distinctively different. Uh, early on, around the 1920s, Sir Ronald Elmer Fisher used the p-value as a continuous measure outside of hypothesis testing and applied in experimental trials. He was very active in the agricultural research field. Whereas Jesse Neiman and Egan Pearson uh, worked on uh, components of hypothesis testing without much emphasis on the p-value. So they uh, established the groundwork for the type 1 and two, type 2 error power, the null hypothesis, alternative hypothesis, etc. But these two things aren't quite similar. And somehow over the years, we sort of mixed them together. And that's what we use in medical research nowadays. Unfortunately, a lot of medical researchers just use an arbitrary cutoff of 0.05 for the p-value to either reject the null hypothesis or to not reject it and thus accept the alternative hypothesis. Yet Sir Reynold Elmer Fisher himself said that no scientific worker has a fixed level of significance at which from year to year and in all circumstances he rejects hypotheses. He examines each particular case in the light of evidence and ideas. And the duo of Neiman and Pearson said it is doubtful whether the knowledge that a p-value was really 0.03 or 0.06 rather than 0.05 would in fact ever modify our judgment. And the tests themselves give no final verdict but as tools help the worker who is using them to form his final decision. And Sir Austin Bradford Hill, recognized as the biggest promoter of the use of statistics in medical research early on, and founding father of clinical epidemiology and public health, said that too often we weaken our capacity to interpret data and to take reasonable decisions, whatever the value of P. And far too often we deduce no difference from no significant difference. The American Statistical Association in 2016 published uh, a set of papers where they warned about the misuse of uh, significance testing and the p-value. Imagine that in the world of construction building, uh, people started to confuse weight and mass and started to talking about WAS and that the American Physical Society issued a, an, an expert statement where they warn about instable engineering. That's basically what happened with ACES warning on p-values. There's a lot of papers published on this problem. For example, here in Science News, uh, they warn about its science dirtiest secret, the scientific method of testing a hypothesis by statistical analysis stands on a flimsy foundation. Most published findings are false. Numerous deep flaws in null hypothesis significance testing. Statistical techniques for testing hypotheses have more flaws than Facebook's privacy policies. I like that one. And um, the title of a very good nature paper, Scientific Method, Statistical Errors. The problem is not that people use p-values poorly. It is that the vast majority of data analysis is not performed by people properly trained to perform data analysis. And the credibility of many scientific claims is being questioned reproducibility crisis. So that last word is something that popped up more and more over the past years. And it is sad that we are in a reproducibility crisis, meaning that a lot of published studies cannot be uh, reproduced because uh, their methodology and use of statistics is flawed. So as already mentioned, the ASA published this paper in the American Statistician in 2016. And they introduced that paper with, let us be clear, nothing in the ASA statement is new. Statisticians and others have been sounding the alarm about these matters for decades to little avail. But we hope that a statement from the world's largest professional association of statisticians would open a fresh discussion and draw renewed and vigorous attention to changing the practice of science with regards to the use of statistical inference.
And they have come up with a new definition for p-values based on the opinion of many renowned uh, statisticians. And that's the definition that uh, we have already learned. It is the probability under a specified statistical model that a statistical summary of the data would be equal to or more extreme than its observed value. Um, but the ESA also uh, issued a number of principles that are important to uh, remember and to think about. So p-values can indicate how incompatible the data are with a specified statistical model. That's what they're there for. And p-values do not measure the probability that the studied hypothesis is true or the probability that the data were produced by random chance alone. And that, as we've already seen, is because we calculate the p-value under the assumption that the null hypothesis is true. And scientific conclusions and business or policy decisions should not be based only on whether a p-value passes a specific threshold. So that p below 0.05 or equal or above 0.05 is called bright line thinking. And we are taught not to use that bright light thinking and avoid artificial thresholds like this. Proper inference requires full reporting and transparency. And a p-value or statistical significance does not measure the size of an effect or the importance of a result, because that effect needs to be estimated. And we're better off to give a good estimate of the effect and look at an associated 95% confidence interval uh, than to only look at the p-value. And whether the results are important or not requires you to use your medical knowledge and logical reasoning. And by itself, a p-value does not provide a good measure of evidence regarding a model or hypothesis. And as I've already alluded to, methods of estimation, so for example, calculating a uh, between group difference and its associated 95% confidence interval is preferred. And then they go on listing some common misunderstandings um, about uh, hypothesis testing and the p-value in this excellent paper in the uh, same uh, issue um, of the American Statistician in 2016, but you can find it in the online supplement. And they conclude with some essential elements for statistics in research uh, that you should keep in mind. And uh, the first thing is to examine the sizes of effect estimates and confidence limits, as well as precise p-values. We should critically examine model assumptions, including the hidden ones such as how results were generated and chosen for presentation. It is false to claim that non-significant results support a test hypothesis, oftentimes uh, that of the null hypothesis, um, uh, indicating no effect, association, or difference, because the same results may be even more compatible with alternative hypotheses. And then statistical significance tests and confidence intervals do not by themselves provide a logically sound basis for concluding an effect is present or absent with certainty or a given probability likelihood. And all statistical methods make extensive assumptions about the sequence of events led to the results presented. Thus a detailed description of the full se sequence of events should be given that led to the statistics presented. And this last one is a call to um, improved uh, transparency in the methodology sections of research papers. All right, that's about it for uh, hypothesis testing and the p-value. I think you did a great job hanging in there. Because seriously, this was a long and tough lesson, very dry material, but I think it's very important to be aware of the exact meaning of p-values, hypothesis testing, and to be aware of uh, all the traps of misinterpretation so that you can go on and create meaningful research and create clinical impact. So I would say thank you and get ready for estimating and testing for differences. <laughs>